This is Emil. And Emil is my grandfather. He died close to 40 years ago. And he died at the age of 78. He died peacefully. He was perfectly conscious, bright memory, until the very last day of his life. Pleasure to, work, to, to live with him. This, on the other hand, is my father, my father Roland. And my father died, ten, he lived 10 years more. He lived at, up to the age of 88. During the last 10 years of his life, my father uh, developed brain uh, degenerescence. So basically what most people would call Alzheimer. The last 10 years of his life were difficult. It was, he couldn't remember the name of his grandsons. He couldn't remember my own name from, uh, at the end of his life. So it was really challenging to see someone who was bright, a bright intellectual, soft-mannered, decline to a stage where it was difficult for him to communicate with the others. So the topic I'm talking about today is the topic of degenerative diseases. And this is an epidemic because we are aging, uh, society is aging, uh, we're changing our food habits, pollution is there, and degenerative uh, diseases are becoming more and more frequent. It is a real uh, issue. I'm going to be... Uh, do you think that if my father would have... If my father died, by the way, 15 years ago. So do you think if he would have lived today, he would have had a different fate than 15 years ago for Alzheimer? Mildly, but probably not very much. But do you think that 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, this situation could change? The topic of my talk is just that. Can we actually do something different? for those people. Let me start with... Uh, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm focusing uh, myself, my studies on cardiology. I'm focusing on heart failure, uh, because heart... And, and I'm going to take that as an example of degenerative diseases. Why? Because heart failure is also an epidemic. Among this audience, how many of you are more than 40 years old? Please raise your hand. Okay, quite a few. Keep your hands up. Out, the bad news is that one out of five of you, and that includes me, by the way, one out of five of you will develop heart failure in the remainder of your life. Worse? You want something worse? Out of the one that developed heart failure, one out of three will die within a year of diagnosis. Scary. So, how does, why does heart failure exist to start with? Uh, think about a heart, your heart, your own heart that pumps 100 milliliters out at each beat, every second, for your lifetime. And he, it pumps out against a pressure that is about the same pressure as you have in the tire of your car. So think about putting 100 milliliter of air in the tire of your car every second for the remainder of your life. And that happens from the time you're born until the time you're dead. There is only one machine in the world that can do that. And that's the heart. Nothing else can do it. So you can imagine as we get older that that machine starts getting tired. Now, about 50% of uh, the, uh, the heart failure are due to heart attacks, what we call myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction occurs when a blood vessel that feeds the heart, which is called the coronary artery, gets blocked. Blocked by a thrombus, gets blocked by uh, anything that stops it. So what happens, the, the blood stops flowing to the ventricle, and that portion, portion of the heart dies. It basically becomes a scar. So 
the, the other, the other uh, when I was in, in, um, in practice, when well, I was practicing 20 years ago, out of five people that were patients that were coming into the intensive care for heart attack, one would die within 30 days. One out of five, 20%. Today, one out of 30 die. It's great, we saved a lot of people. But all the people that did not, that died and do not die anymore, have a very big scar, and they die, and they suffer from heart failure because of that very big scar. So this is the first cause of heart failure. This, the other causes are uh, hypertension, valvular diseases, etc. There is a number of other, the other, different other causes. Now, the problem, if, if you have a big scar, is that the rest of the heart has to pump and compensate for that part that does not beat. How do we solve this? Imagine if we could. This is the heart that beats, this is the portion that does not beat. Imagine that we could replace that portion with a portion that beats again. Imagine we could reconstruct that scar and have the heart beats again. We would have erased heart failure. And why is it important? Cardiovascular diseases is the first cause of death in the world today. People think about cancer. People think about infectious diseases. No, cardiovascular is the first cause of death, twice the second cause, which is cancer, and twice the third cause, which is, which is um, infectious diseases. So is it worth trying to do something about it? Probably. But how can we replace that scar? How can we actually get that tissue that is not beating to repair itself? Look back in, into, into the time. Look at some species that we currently know. In, in science, we call, there's a specific uh, animal that is called a zebrafish that can heal itself very easily. But in your everyday life, you see uh, lizards, you see salamanders, and if you chop the, the limb of a lizard or salamander, it's going to grow again, right? You've, we've all seen that in our, in, our, in our science courses. What grows? The bone grows. The, the, the muscle grow, the tissue grow, the vessels grow, everything. You have a new, perfectly functional limb a few uh, days after, after the accident happened. We humans have lost that capacity. Have we completely lost it? Not really. Some organs have kept that capacity. Why do the have the bone, for example, kept the capacity? Why does the skin kept that capacity? Well, it's simple. This is about evolution again. 10,000 years ago, our ancestors lived until 15, 20, sometimes 25, sometimes 30 for the very old ones. But they were dying after that. And the, no, the quote-unquote noble organs like the, the, the heart, the, the kidney, the, 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 the spleen, all those organs did not have the time to age and get sick and fail. However, those early humans we're still hurting themselves, we're still getting wounded, we're still breaking their bones. So nature, in its intelligence, have kept the capacity to, re to repair the organs for those particular organs and have lost it for the others. And why? Because it's in equilibrium. If you, if you have the capacity to repair yourself, you have more propensity to make cancers. So nature, basically the evolution, managed, managed to keep that capacity for the organ that were at high risk and lose that capacity Remember, we're talking about people age, living up to the age of 30 and, and lost that capacity for the other organs. So can we teach the heart to regain the capacity? There is an organ that we can look at that does this very well, the bone. When you look at the bone, there are little cells in that bone, little factories, of which task is to repair the bone. They're called osteoblasts. That's their only job, is to do that. The heart and the other organ that are non-reparative do not have those cells. So what scientists did uh, in the early 2000s was, okay, let's try to take cells that are close to that and try to inject them into the heart. So what we did was take cells from the hip, from the bone marrow, 
people call them stem cells, they're not really stem cells, but people call them stem cells. We injected them into the heart of patients, and it did some repair. But it did it in about 20% of the patients. 20% of patients had a repair capacity using those cells. 80% of the patients did not. Now we need to, to understand why some patients were repairing themselves and some patients did not repair themselves. So this is actually, you need to think about it as cues, codes, how to resolve this issue. Here we see that the patients that did not repair themselves, the cells have a very, are very different from the patients that repair themselves. You see on the bottom part of the slide, the cells are, are of a different color than on the upper part of the, of the chart. So the question is, can we transform the cells that are non-reparative into cells that are reparative? It seems easy. It's a little bit more complex than that. So what we did for that is go back into the embryology. Try to understand when the cells are still in, pre in kindergarten. They can still do about anything in the embryo. They can become... Uh, heart, they can become liver, they can become bone. It's the same thing as kids, they can become doctors, they can become engineers, and they can become artists. So we need to teach that cell to become something that it was not programmed to do. And how do we do this? To give you an order of magnitude, a cell, the, the way a cell transforms itself is through receptors that are on the surface of the cell. Consider them as locks. Those are locks. And then you have keys that go into that lock, which are the signals, the proteins, that activate that lock. So picture a, a safe, a big safe, and in which there are many, many, many doors. And you have 100 locks that open one specific door. And that door is the door of cardiac reprogramming. <laughs> First, you need to find which are the locks. Beyond, uh, among the thousands of locks, which are the right hundred locks that are responsible for that? Second, I'm going to give you a bag full of 100,000 keys. 100,000 keys. Those are the keys that, those are the proteins that exist in the body that activate all the locks. Now that you have found the lock, I want you to find the key that is going to open each one of those locks. Each one in the right sequence. To spare you the calculation, the odds of finding this by, by uh, accident is less than winning the lotto 1,000 times in a row. <laughs> so, but we had again a code. Why? Because in the early 2000s, what we did was we found a protein. And when we were putting those cells in culture and putting the protein with it, instead of, of having 1% or 2% of the cells becoming heart cells, we had 50% of the cell, of cells having heart cells, becoming heart cells. So now we started having some signals. What is happening? And we figured out, what is this protein doing? And, and the protein is doing this. I'm going to quiz you on this at the end of the show. <laughs> so the protein activates all those signals. And that is the code that makes a cell from non-cardiac cell to become a cardiac cell. This is the secret, if you want, the code. Next thing, OK, now we know how to do the cells. Do, go back to our original concept. Do those cells actually work better than non-modified cells? So we did this. We injected those cells into animals, into mice. And this is the results we got. On the left side, you have a mouse that was treated with cells that were not modified, and you see within the dotted line that the scar, the white part, is still there. And you do a section through this, you see the scar about at uh, more or less uh, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, you see the scar on the top. On the right side, this animal was treated with the cells that were modified from the same patient, and this scar isn't there anymore. So it's interesting. We seem to see that for the first time in the world, someone was able to reconstruct a heart using cells from patients, an adult heart using cells from patients. The next step was, OK, now does it actually work in patients? And then we did a study of 45 patients. We published that data recently. 
And we have been able to see that the patients were actually walking better, living better. Uh, some patients could go and do their grocery while they were not able to go and, do and, and go from their bed to their, to their chair. So it, we had some very, very positive signals. But I want to be careful, because it's not the first time when we do a small study of 45 patients, and then when we do a big study, we cannot replicate what we find in the small study. So I hope we're gonna, we are on the way of resolving something, but I'm not sure that we have yet done it. So we're in the process of doing this now. But imagine just for a second that we could do this, do this with the brain. Imagine we could do this with the pancreas to cure diabetes. Imagine we could do this for, the, for Parkinson's disease. This is the field of regenerative medicine. This is the dream that we're trying to achieve. Now, don't misunderstand the challenges of this. From using powders to treat symptoms and drugs and injectable, now we need to produce living things, cells. We need to ship those cells. We need to inject those cells. We need to preserve those cells. We need the system to be able to support, the social security system to be able to support these type of treatments. So it's not an insignificant uh, challenge that is still ahead of us. There's many, many other challenges that we need to solve. But think of a world for a second where we will die still, but die healthy. Thank you. <laughs>